This week, we are very excited to introduce a special guest, our very own benefactor, if you will, Paul Asadorian. Okay, to be honest, we had a last-minute cancellation, but I really have been intending on having Paul join us on the show, so it just kind of worked out uh, that today's the day. Uh, Many of you are familiar with Paul already, but for those that are new to the Security Weekly family, I want you to meet our founder and CTO and ask him about his vision, not only for the entire Security Weekly Productions network, but our show in particular. So join us as we learn why we are tearing down silos and building bridges on Security and Compliance Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. And now, it's the show that bridges the requirements of regulations, compliance, and privacy with those of security. Your trusted source for complying with various mandates, building effective programs, and current compliance news. It's time for Security and Compliance Weekly. RSA offers business-driven security solutions that provide organizations with a unified approach to managing digital risk that hinges on integrated visibility, automated insights, and coordinated actions. RSA solutions are designed to effectively detect and respond to advanced attacks, manage user access control, and reduce business risk, fraud, and cybercrime. RSA protects millions of users around the world and helps more than 90% of the Fortune 500 companies thrive and continuously adapt to transformational change. For more information, visit Security Week dot com forward slash rsa security welcome to episode number 25 can you believe it it's episode 25 already of security and compliance weekly recorded on april what is today april 21st 2020 i am your host mr jeff mann and my co-hosts mr scott lyons mr josh marpet and mr matt alderman Gentlemen, welcome. Happy Tuesday, gentlemen. It's another beautiful episode. Day. Episode twenty-five. Here we episode go. 25. We haven't killed each other yet. That's, that's, that's a miracle. Well, we're that's part of that. the beauty of being virtual is we don't get to see each other in person all the time. Hey, before we jump into uh, today's very special interview, I do have a few announcements. Going cloud native. See how to integrate application security in our next webcast with Signal Sciences. Learn how penetration testing reduces risk in our May webcast with Core Security, which is a help systems company. You can register for our upcoming webcasts or virtual trainings by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash webcast. You can also access our on-demand library of previously recorded webcasts and trainings by visiting securityweekly.com slash on-demand. Each webcast uh, you listen to, you earn one CPE credit that we will submit on your behalf, as long as you provide us your ISC squared number. Also, we have officially migrated back to our original mailing list on our original platform. We have our categories nailed down and you are now able to customize what you receive from us based on your preferences by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe and clicking the button to join the list. Once you've joined, you'll also be able to go back and update your interests so that we can grow with you as you progress through your journey in InfoSec. All righty then. So uh, we were originally going to have an interview today with someone else, and I'm not even going to say who they are. You'll just have to come back later, and I don't want to put them on the spot because it sounds like they're having a a day job operational crisis, and I certainly don't want to call that out. So uh, we were lucky enough to have our our founder and CTO, who's self-isolating in studio, which is also his office, Mr. Paul Asadorian. So, Paul, welcome. Hey, to thanks, Secure Jeff. And Compliance Weekly and Company. Congrats on 25 episodes. It's a great milestone. Yeah, it's uh, they're 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 clicking up pretty quickly. It's it's kind of weird. Not the, not that we're in the 900 range like the main show, but they do add up. You're getting into the 20s, and you're you're in full stride. It's good. Cool. Well, uh, it's funny because I, I, I've been kind of thinking that we should have you on the show sometime anyway. Uh, 
because uh, in theory we're trying to 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 grow an audience that is unaccustomed to security weekly and this sort of the hacker security side of the world we have our i i our eyes focused, if you will, on sort of the other side uh, of the security world, being the compliance, auditing, assessment side of the world. Uh, so I'm 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 proactively, optimistically thinking that we do have some sort of audience out there that has no idea who you are and who is this Paul guy anyway. And so I'm glad that you're on the show today to to talk to us. Hey, I love spending time with you guys. So it's awesome. <laughs> it's all it's almost as good as being together almost almost um so we, ask him our we start off, question. come on yeah well we start off uh, our our interviews uh, sort of trying to keep the spirit of security weekly but also trying to be unique uh and, and a little bit different so we like to ask our guests uh, uh the same generic question because we are a show that's focused on security and compliance weekly paul we would simply ask you what's your take or wh where do you fall in what we like to call the security versus compliance continuum it's kind of an open-ended question but what's your take i you know when we did a segment on this uh late last year and mm -hmm. I admittedly, when I first created the segment, I'm like, oh, this will be a fun, really controversial, like we're going to really duke it out uh, kind of segment. And then when I started writing up my notes for it, I was like, really what it came down to was security and compliance have a very interesting relationship. And I think it's very dynamic um, and very difficult to navigate. And I, I don't, I think when I came out of it, I was like, it's really not security versus compliance. It's how do they interact to benefit each other? Um, and, you know, I, I think that from a security perspective, when I look at compliance, sometimes, and I think it's very similar to, you know, regulations or other guidelines, right? I sometimes want it to be more specific. Other times I want it to be more left up to interpretation. Uh, and so, for example, you know, there's applications uh, uh, I'm developing and we're developing where the compliance standards or guidelines or however you want to, uh, you know, when we encounter anything like that, if they're not specific enough, sometimes I'm like, I wish there was more, more guidance there. In other words, you know, there may be language in there that says you should protect those credentials or mm -hmm. you should validate those requests from the user in this protocol or whatever. And I'm like, language like that leaves up a lot to interpretation. I think it, it, I got thinking about it just before when you had asked me to come on the show today. You know, very much like the RFCs, they tried to be generic enough to define a protocol. But oftentimes, like when you think about UDP, right? They're like, well, validating the data that's coming in through this protocol is left up to the application and you should do things to protect and validate it. And I'm like, well, what, is, what does that mean? That could be a lot of things. <laughs> you know, protecting yep. a credential. It, did, it doesn't say encrypting that credential, right? It could say protecting it. Well, how, how do I protect it, right? Do I write it to a file on the file system? Maybe that's protection in some people's view. So I think sometimes I wish compliance was more specific. Other times I wish it was less specific so that you had more freedom because as I look at application security, for example, everyone's different. Your business requirements are different. Your applications are different. The implementations are different. It's different through different versions. It depends on the language and framework. And if it's too specific, it makes it very difficult for me as, let's say, an application developer to go, how do I meet this compliance uh, standard? So I, I think in summary, it's a very interesting relationship. And my goal for this show and the, the vision was to bring together security people and compliance people, right? Because we all, we've known, we all have known each other for a long time and we know a lot of people in the community and there are some folks that are more focused on compliance and others that are more focused on other areas within security. And I want those two groups to come together and learn from each other, right? I think the people who are uh, doing cloud security today and application development need to learn from the compliance folks and, and vice versa. That is a very thorough answer. Thank you. Uh, it, it's funny because um, 
the the relationship between security and compliance is, is almost paradoxical. I think I'm using the right word. Um, and I, I've seen it for years specifically within, oh, I right, go ahead and drink PC, the PCI world. But uh, the, this whole notion that you've got this one group of organizations that are trying to meet PCI or whatever standard, and they're complaining, and this has been a lot of my customers, at how... Uh, how difficult, how hard it is to meet all the different requirements. And then on the on the flip side, you've got a set of, and I'm going to loosely label them security practitioners that sort of look at PCI and, and, and scoff at it thinking, well, that's just the bare minimum. That's just, that's not even really security. It's just a checkbox. It's are you doing some, you know, barely getting into the security of things. And it's always fascinated me that those two uh, perceptions about this thing called PCI specifically, but compliance in general, sort of coexist. And and while there's elements of truth to both of them, they can't both be right. And they and yet they're not both wrong either. One thing that, that PCI I think does really well, it does really well, is defining the merchant levels. And that's something I don't see in a lot of other standards. In other words, mm -hmm. if I were to look at a NIST compliance or OWASP, you know, guidance, it, there's nothing in those standards that say, well, if you're processing this kind of data uh, or you're at this scale, uh, then here are your security requirements, right? And that's one thing I thought PCI did really well was defining by merchant level um, what mm -hmm. level of protections you should put into place. So I think that's really interesting. So... Yes, but it's it's nuanced and and it's it's while I agree with what you're saying, you're you're wrong in a sense. Uh, the the differences are not based on merchant level and merchant level for those that don't know within PCI are based on the volume of tr of transactions. How many credit cards, debit cards are you processing in a year? That's what defines the the merchant levels. What you're addressing though, Paul, is for the smaller merchants, they have this opportunity uh, to self-assess. And the self-assessment questionnaires that exist within PCI, uh, while they uh, necessarily are used by smaller merchants, and so there's an allowance for you don't have to look at all of the you know hundreds and hundreds of requirements, they're actually based on how do you take credit cards? What is the what is the payment method? The payment accept mm -hmm. acceptance method, and th and that's where the the self assessment questionnaires they they sort of limit you to okay if you're only doing e commerce let's say there isn't a whole lot of reason to look at physical security and and look at you know various other requirements that are written assuming that you've got you know, face-to-face -face customers and what they call brick and mortar, you know, sort of the traditional transaction right. so that's, or vice that's, versa. But that's even better. There's an extra dimension uh, built yep. into it, which I think is even better. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And and I guess my other thought, and I'll let everybody else uh, beat up, I mean, ask you questions mm -hmm. in a moment, but uh, the, the other paradox I see uh, in terms of compliance in general, and, and, and again, P PCI most specifically, is because it's necessarily sort of uh, at times open-ended and non-specific, and, and I understand why it's like that, because, uh, you know, the council, the PCI council that writes the standards, they have long... Um, tried to very much avoid sort of putting a stake in the ground and saying this is enough. They, in the whole PCI ecosystem, they expect merchants and organizations to be talking to a security expert. And the security expert in, in the context of PCI is generally the QSA, the Qualified Security Assessor. And to some degree, it's the, uh, the uh, for those smaller companies that have to only sort of get the external vulnerability scan, you know, from our tenable days, the mm -hmm. ASV scan. There's something called an ASV engineer. So those are the experts that interact with mm -hmm. merchants that may or may not have security expertise within, you know, within their operations. But the, the, the paradox is, that, you know, the council doesn't want to put a stake in the sand and say, do this, this is enough, because in, in inevitably, 
that's not enough <laughs> because right. something happens, a new vulnerability is discovered and blows up. But while the intent is there to be, you know, open ended in terms of, you know, do something, here's the sort of general framework guidelines of do all these different types of things from security. What happens more times than not, and this is sort of my big frustration of PCI specifically, is how the whole industry because customers want to pay less, they don't want to be bothered, whatever the reasons are, they, you know, because it's open-ended, they gravita- gravitate more often than not to the bare minimum, which is generally not enough. Where the opportunity is there to, okay, let's look at these requirements as sort of a framework and let's figure out how to do it and do it well and do it right. Nobody does that. And, yeah, so I, and I, think, I think people need to be reminded where we were with, credit card theft before there was even a bare minimum. And I, mm-hmm. I think it's something that the security industry sometimes loses sight of. Uh, and it was the book by Kevin Paulson Kingpin that I thought did a great job of not only telling a, a, a really neat story, but showing, you know, telling us how bad things were in terms of credit card theft before mm-hmm. people started adopting, an organization started adopting PCI. And we had this these standards and frameworks in place, QSAs, ASVs, defining that bare minimum and even if you wanted to meet that bare minimum well after i read that book i was like that's still way better than things were before and the goal wasn't to make 100 percent of credit card merchants 100 percent secure that was never the right. goal the goal right. kind of similar to covid 19 right was to squash the curve right was to well, reduce yeah. reduce the number of credit cards that were being stolen on a regular basis and if you look at that as a measurement, I think PCI has done a fantastic job of achieving that goal. Now, we've looked at it and twisted it, and I think even myself are guilty of saying, well, you know, if a company just wants to be PCI compliant, that doesn't mean they're secure and they're not done and people get this, you know, misconception. But that's not the goal mm-hmm. of PCI. It, so no, it really Paul, isn't. No, go yeah, ahead, you guys, guys are talking interesting things, and, and you've gone over the difference between descriptive and prescriptive controls. And you've gone over the fact that technology changes and you've gone over the fact that that stuff is weird and we need to watch out for it and, and that there's a complex relationship. And you're right. I mean, like, like let, let me back you up a little bit, Paul. Can you define a pen test, please? Yeah, uh, exactly. Exactly. I mean, and there is one thing that definition. PCI requires, right? And there is no one definition of, of pen testing. Uh, and I think especially today, every penetration testing firm and uh, largely uh, many of my friends that, that do this today, it is different for every single organization, right? And where I think the pen testing has matured, uh, ironically, is to define the maturity level of the organization from a security perspective and then tune the testing to the benefit of that organization, if it's done correctly. Of course, there are still people out there that are saying a pen test is a vulnerability scan. Yeah. It, it Come comes on, down to scoping, the right? Logo. What's it, wrong it, with you? We, we have scoping issues from a compliance perspective. Uh, you talked about the merchant levels. NIST, in its implementation for the federal government under the FIPS requirements, FIPS 199 to 200, actually attempt to do aspects of that. Now, there it's only high, medium, and low based on how you answer the 199, but its attempt is to say, look, one size does not fit all, mm-hmm. and here's a guidance for the at least the federal agencies when it comes to implementing NIST 853. And the federal agencies says high, medium, or low, here's your controls, right? Similar to what PCI kind of did with the merchant levels. But when you get outside of those two standards, scoping becomes a part of this. What is in scope potentially for a business, uh, what potential risks am I trying to protect? And coming up with a set of controls to implement is still, I think, where one of the big challenges from a compliance perspective is because it's not always a Mm one-size-fits-all. Let me um, qualify your in-scope statement slightly because it's nuanced and a lot of people miss this, Uh, people people within the PCI world in particular. Uh, and PCI itself, the standard as it's evolved and the PCI council, uh, sort of created this problem. Um, there's, there's, there's two ways to interpret the term in scope. Uh, the, the first way is to say, you know, here, here's the PCI data security standard, you know, 
12 major requirements, 400 roughly uh, specific requirements. Um, the first way to look at is at in scope is do you as an organization have to follow these requirements? Does PCI apply to you? And the PCI Council has qualified over the years. Uh, if you can isolate your your payment systems and all the systems um, that touch or have something to do with your credit card processing, and, and you can you can segment them off, you can only apply PCI to those systems, and the rest of your network we're not going to look at. Now, in the early days, the presumption was flat network. PCI applies to everything until you prove to us differently that you've you've carved out and segmented in some way. The other way that that InScope applies to PCI is in terms of, um, and again, this goes sort of the to the history of PCI. What applies to the assessment itself, especially if a QSA is coming in and looking at your environment to try to see if you're following all the rules. So. It's what's in scope for the assessment specifically versus what's in scope in terms of what you have to, uh, what systems within your network, within your environment has to, to adhere to the PCI requirements. It's a nuanced difference, um, but I, I'll give you one brief example. In the early days, I think prior to version two of the PCI standard, which so this is going back to 2010, I believe, um, PCI, the way it originally rolled out, with the presumption that bad guys were going to go after the 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 mother load. Where where do you have the millions of credit cards stored? So, you know, break in, find your your database, your repository, steal all the data, and get out. There was a a threshold for uh, a QSA coming in if if it was assumed or proven that a system handled less than 500,000 cards, don't quote me on that number, I think that's the number, then you didn't have to look at it for PCI. So there was this limitation that was put on the, the, the PCI assessment in the early days of if it's just onesie, twosie here and there, don't worry about it, don't look at it. That's changed, but I, but I had a customer back in the in the late 2000s that um famous company you would have heard of it they were famously breached they were in the news one of the companies involved with the alberto gonzalez uh, hacking ring um, they well no it's not them it's another one but but this company uh, they had they had they had excluded a, a whole business unit uh, happened to be their call center operations from the PCI assessment because of the presumption that there wasn't that many cards. You know, it was just people taking orders, people reviewing orders, settling disputes. There isn't a whole lot of card data there. Um, turns out they were wrong. But but that whole segment of their network, there's all their systems involved in their call center operations, which was accessing the database and the mother load and so on and so forth, was excluded, sort of rightfully so, based on the rules at the time, because the the presumption or the belief was, well, there isn't that that critical mass of credit cards there, so we don't need to look at it. So long-winded answer, just to say that there's a nuanced difference in terms of in scope between what applies to the standard, you gotta follow the rules, versus what is the QSA gonna look at when they come in and do their assessment? I'll so shut I, up now guess, and let the rest of you talk. Like, How do you know where your sensitive data is, credit cards or other, if you're not looking? And and that's one of the you know strains of mm -hmm. you know a chain of conversation we're having uh, a lot of our other shows is yep. obviously everyone's working from home. How do you know what data everyone has if you're not looking for it? And this can apply to really any compliance standard. If it's speaking right. about data security, I think there has to be an element that says you have to look basically everywhere or in systems that you control. Or, I, you know, I, I guess that's kind of a nuanced point. Do you need to scour every computer system in the entire world looking for your data? Or just the system that's processing credit cards, the answer is probably somewhere in between. And how do we define a standard that 
doesn't allow people to say, oh, yeah, I'm done. I don't have to look there. There should be a certain level of due diligence that yeah, I am looking for it on home users, uh, computers, uh, or maybe the corporate issued laptop that's at a person's home right now, because I have some technology that allows me to look for that. Tenable had technology. There's a lot of companies that have, have that technology. I think it's an important right. component to compliance, but certainly not an easy thing to define. Well, I, I said I was going to shut up, but I'll, let me say one more thing, <laughs> and then maybe I'll shut up. Um, I don't in, in, in turn, <laughs> no, probably probably shouldn't believe it. Uh, one of my sort of pet peeves, just as an aging industry professional growing up in the DoD and so on and so forth, is I think one of the things that is wrong is our attitude in the, our whole industry that there's this perception that secure or security means secure everything. And I was taking some notes as I was looking at the news stories for our for our next segment. You know, sort of what are you know. We all agree and disagree on different things, but if we were going to boil down the fundamentals of where do we start, it sort of is what you're talking about, Paul. It's it's this notion that we have to secure everything, but what or where is everything? And I, and I think that's where we get wrapped around the axle. PCI actually tried to address that when they came out with version three back in 2013, where they said, look, if you're going to segment your network you need to come up with some sort of methodology that you can show to your qsa where you you've done the due diligence of going through your entire network and discovered your data and and either moved it relocated it deleted it or at least identified it so you know where it is um what was interesting was uh, you know sort of picking up on this uh you know bare minimum approach a lot of companies latched on to that thinking well if you know if we can straighten things up and clean things up and reduce it down to this one s relatively small segment we can save money and, and mm. simplify pci by only looking at a certain thing the the beauty of it in my opinion was and, and this wasn't the in, the intent necessarily but the effect was all these companies a lot of my customers actually went through and looked at their entire network looked at all the data flows process flows asked everybody if and when and how do they ever touch transaction credit card data they did this whole discovery thing and in doing that they found out well you know joe schmo over in the marketing department has a really doesn't with, need yeah. to have access <laughs> yeah. you know, he's yeah. downloaded a spreadsheet right so in effect, they cleaned up everything and isolated things, reducing the footprint, and even though that wasn't their intention, they became more secure because they, they and I know you know this, Paul, from the early days where credit card data it was, was everywhere. Yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Now, at least it's in, in, in locations that hopefully that they know about. There still might be a lot of data, but they at least know where it is. And if people are accessing it, hopefully they're doing it more securely and it's, it's more measured. But, and I also think that GDPR had a similar effect on, on PII. Josh, yeah, sorry, I I, you keep wanting to make a point. Go ahead. Well, okay, so the, 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 no, no, it's okay. Uh, you're the guest and you should be talking, dear God. But I mean, the, the problem <laughs> is, is that you're believing that, uh, and Jeff, you're kind of believing your own hype here. Uh, <laughs> you're like, well, PCI made people understand where their data was, and I'm going to tell you they don't. Uh, PCI no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I, it was... They cleaned up their data in sort of in spite of themselves. <laughs> oh, and that, no, that and, I will agree yeah, with. And, and, and that, certainly the, not everyone, but I, I think it did have that effect. And I think we saw that effect on, uh, you know, the, the dark web or however you want to phrase it, right? That it wasn't as easy to obtain, right? I mean, the, they tell a great story where... Um, the I forget who, uh, Max Vision, right? Breaks into a, a pizza shop. And lo and behold, that's the system processing credit cards. But, you know, there's a file on there that contained 20,000 credit cards. Well, like, that's awesome. I'll take a copy of that and delete it. And now I've got that to uh, trade around and, and barter with and maybe monetize myself, right? And I think that when the, as the PCI standards evolved, it really did cut down on oh, a yeah. lot of that. I'm not saying it wiped it out completely, right? No, but no, I think it did it, cut but, down on the accessibility the, of that data. And I think GDPR had the same effect for PII. I don't think there's, uh, right? Companies I are going- I think GDPR is gonna have a different effect, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that is because the PII is so incredibly important these days for marketing and demographic purposes. I think what we're gonna see is actually, and I've been stating this, we're starting to see smaller companies laundering data. Uh, yes. So this is a side discussion, Correct. sorry, but we're, we're seeing smaller companies holding data for bigger companies. Right. I'm waiting for the mm -hmm. first company to spin out a smaller company specifically to hold data 
so that if something happens, oh, look, it wasn't us. It was that small company we rent access to the data from. Okay. But because credit cards are only used for one thing, and that's getting money effectively. Okay. Or opening lines of credit. Same idea, getting <clears> money. <throat> PII is used for multiple things. Uh, uh, getting access to health insurance, getting access to people's lives. Uh, it, it's a little more multi-use, if that makes sense. Right. But there's also a, in comparing the two, right, PCI also changed how much of that credit card data was being stored, right? Oh, very much. Yeah, and you're right. I think GDPR is in the same thing. Like, do I need to store your social security number and your full name together? Like, maybe I just need to know these anonymized bits about you. And we do that at Security Weekly, right? I, I don't need to know who you are, I need to know maybe like that you work in a particular industry and you have a particular title. I don't need to identify that is with Josh, the person, right? I just right. need to know that someone that works for this type of company with this title is a listener of that show. And, and becoming I, more mindful of the data. You're absolutely, yes, I totally exactly. agree with you. And I agree with you that uh, PCI made them think the same way. They became mindful of the credit card data. The The, the question is, is, is I have this horrible, horrible idea that most companies don't know where their data is or what they're holding in, in most times and places. And, and I think or, that we can all or Josh, they actually companies do, that have that problem. And they know how valuable it is and they're not going to give it up easily. No, 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 uh, uh, nope. Would you like to there explain, are companies Scott? out there. There, well, hold on, I'm getting there. Uh, it, it's not just limited to smalls, right? There are larges that are out there that don't know what their data is doing. They don't know where yeah. it's going. They don't know who's using it. They don't know who's making millions and millions off of the data that they've given Carblosh access to for years and haven't followed up on billing. You know, the the problem is is that companies don't know what their data is doing, right? It doesn't matter whether you're small or large. I can actually give no, you an I example agree, that goes right back I to Jeff's comment about PCI. Some people do, uh, do know what data they have and how valuable it is because they're monetizing it. Mm. And I think those companies that know that don't nope. like things like GDPR, CCPA, because they know it's going to have an impact on their revenue side. Now, I okay, do so what there a GDPR, are others hold on, that Matt, don't hold on, let's stop right there. Is. Let's stop right I, there. Let's that. stop right there. Let's say what, what impact has GDPR and CCPA had on Facebook? Okay, what impact has GDPR and CCPA had on Google? Okay, what impact on other companies has these compliance regimes that we're talking about with enforcement of data privacy and data standards, what impact have they had on the bigger businesses that shuffle data? They haven't yet. That was That's part of my point is they know exactly how valuable that data is and they're going to find ways around it. Mm-hmm. So all how, how, do we, how do we go about fixing that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. I was just saying, I think we're all in violent agreement or disagreement, depending on how you look at things. Sorry, I'm mixing. I'm mixing my next cocktail. Here. No, 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 no. no. That, that's fine. Matt, Matt, let me throw it. Matt, let me throw it back at you. How do we go about fixing that? Like, where, where do we start? Where can companies start in fixing that? Or the people who built the compliance regime, like I'll give you an example, you know, a couple episodes ago, uh, we had uh, uh, Chris on from the CMMCAB, right? If the CMMC standard becomes ineffective, right, there's an easy way to diagnose and triage how to make it re-effective. But when you're talking about monolithic stuff, such as GDPR and CCPA, where in the hell, where in the hell do we start to fix this, right? How do we keep the, the bigs in line you know, in in managing our data appropriately, seeing that they have become stewards effectively, right? Uh, and protect our online privacy, right? Where do we start to fix this? See, this is where I think um, things like GDPR have an opportunity, but it's it, the the footprint's too small. It's Europe, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that Europe's small. But we don't have an equivalent outside of a state regulation on the consumer side and CCPA out of California. I think the only way to get there is to do it at a more national level. Now, I'm not a big believer in national regulation, by the way, but I don't know how else you do it because how else do you get a hold of that mass amount of data unless you do it at a national level? Um, so I, I don't, I don't think there's an easy answer here. Cause I'll tell you right now, it's not fine. Facebook was fine. Yeah. Fine. What? $5 billion last year it was a drop in the bucket for them. Um, yeah. so fines aren't going to do it. There has to be a broader regulation, uh, or I, I don't think it gets addressed or resolved at all. 
See, but but the the problem with the broader regulation is that you have you already have CCPA on the books, right? And unfortunately, in the U.S., what a lot of Congress critters and Senate Senate critters like to do, right? Whether they're uh, um, state, you know, uh, you know, not where other uh, state Congress critters and state Senate Senate critters like to do is to take an existing drafted language, modify the state name, and then push it through, right? So basically, they're carbon copying what another state is doing just so that they can pad their, well, I push this through and I push this through, right? Instead of truly engaging with practitioners and saying, does this fit the need for the protection of people in our state, right? Yep. So the real question is, is how do we get that infusion of knowledge from a tech side into effectively not only uh, legal, right, but also judicial uh, uh, actions? Right to be able to it hold almost, these companies responsible. Go ahead. It almost sounds like it's it's a topic for another for a future segment. Hey, I I wanted to be sensitive to our time, and I did promise our, our listening audience that that Paul would give us a little bit of the background and vision of Security Weekly just overall. Uh, you know, for those that are listening that are sort of new to this whole thing. So, Paul, if you could real quickly in wrapping up uh, this segment, just sort of. You know, give us a real fast forward from where did we all, where did this all start? How did we get to the point where we've got uh, Security Compliance Weekly, and where do you see us going in the future? Please. Josh is already laughing because it it started like <laughs> basically we wanted to get around uh, a table and drink beer or cocktails and talk about security, right? And that's mm. that's really the only reason we created the show <laughs> early on. I mean, yeah, there were microphones and we're like people might listen, but we really just wanted to get drunk and talk security. Uh, and lo and behold, people listened. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of different uh, personas in our audience. And our growth has um, been really solely driven by tapping into those different personas. So there is the, the persona that likes to hear a bunch of folks have, a, you know, really spirited discussion in the format of a two hour show. And what we fairly quickly realized was that that's not everyone who wants to listen to what we have to say. Um, so mm. the the newer shows and the growth of the network have really stemmed from, hey, there's an, an audience or a subset of our audience out there and potential audience that wants a new show that doesn't want a two or three hour show. They want a 20 to 30 minute show that has us distill down the news. So we, uh, over multiple iterations, ultimately now uh, produce um, Security News Weekly. Uh, mm -hmm. that does just that, right? Uh, and then right. the Enterprise Security Weekly show stemmed from basically Matt and I working together at Tenable uh, and covering the enterprise security solutions um, that and no one else was really doing that with the candor that we were able to infuse into that show. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I believe today it is our most downloaded show, I think largely because we're not afraid to point at a vendor solution and go, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's going to solve people's problems. But this other one, I think we agree with, and it, it, it has potential to solve people's problems. Uh, and people love that because navigating the you know, right to the right solution is extremely difficult when you're trying to protect everything from yourself all the way up to a large enterprise. So um, that was the progression of, of that show. And the other shows were were kind of natural in those uh, trying to appeal to different personas, right? The application developer in Application Security Weekly. We already talked about this show, right? Bridging that security mm -hmm. and compliance uh, to different personas uh, inside of the same show. Um, mm -hmm. What other shows do we have? Uh, Business Security Weekly, yeah. Tradecraft. Yeah, so business yeah. was was all about uh, the CISOs. I mean, that actually started out as Startup Security Weekly, uh, and mm -hmm. what we found was that largely the executive audience was listening. And so we, we changed gears. Uh, and now we have a show for uh, those that are aspiring to be uh, executives in security and, and those that are already executives in security uh, and what they need to know about security, right? Which is very different from some of the more technical offerings like Tradecraft and some of our webcasts and, and virtual training, which focus more on the, the technical aspect. And I think you can expect more in the virtual trainings uh, and technical. Uh, Jeff, your uh, employer uh, did an awesome one with us. Uh, in fact, our first virtual training on cracking passwords. Um, so you can expect to see a lot more of that that content come up. 
Um, and in right. terms of the future, you know, I think one of the things we've always heard from our audience is that now we produce so much content that they need help navigating. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, Matt and I and the entire team are working on having a subscription site where you can tell us about your interest. When we produce content in that interest, uh, we will send, notify you that that content has been produced. Um, and, and also including enrichment of those uh, of that content, right? So more uh, technical how-tos accompanying some of the content we produce will be in that uh, subscription site and, and giving you access to the archives, right? Like uh, we've done a ton of webcasts um, and so those are all going to be archived on that site uh, as well. That'll tie into the mailing list. That's why you hear us talking about the mailing list and subscribing is just giving our audience a much richer experience to uh, get what they want out of the, the shows here at Security Weekly. Great. So it all starts uh, for our listening audience, in case you don't know, probably most of you do, with going to securityweekly.com. You can find a tab for the shows and see all the shows listed. Our goal is to provide something for everybody. Uh, as, as Paul alluded to, we have a very diverse uh, listening audience, a growing audience, and, and we want to grow it even more because we're interested in, in presenting information in a practical way. Uh, straightforward manner, no matter what the topic is. Paul, thanks so much for uh, joining us today in a pinch. Uh, it almost was like a, a, a planned thing. I appreciate that. Uh, it was good to virtually see you. We're going to take a break. We'll come back and talk security and compliance news. 